So are you a big happy family or are you not? That's the question. And today we hope to solve that dilemma. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you first what doesn't work with a big family in the homeschool, and then we're gonna talk about what I've found works, and then we're gonna brainstorm because some of you have ideas I didn't use, haven't thought of, okay? I'm Julie Bogart from BraveWriter.com. I had five kids. Well, I still have them, but they're all grown. My youngest is 19 and my oldest is 28. They have all, despite all my flaws, all my mistakes, all my failings, turned into adults that I enjoy. I look forward to spending time with them. I'm glad when they come home and I respect the choices they've made in their lives. Out of the five, four of them, well, two of them have completed college. One is in law school. Two are still in college as sophomores in college. And then Noah, my oldest, is on his third third time through college. And he's actually enjoying it and getting through it in a way that works for him this time. So we've had various strategies for how to get into adulthood and how to use your education. My, um, my kids, and I'll pull this back around so you can see who they were when they were little. So this is Noah. This is Johanna. What do you notice right away? Who's holding the baby? Johanna's holding the baby. We call her the displaced firstborn child <laughs> because she was like the little mother. Noah never had a first child bone in his body. He was his own person, did whatever he wanted, uh, and was basically unschooled for a lot of his life. Johanna, on the other hand, really loved checking off boxes. She did some part-time enrollment in the local high school and was very much, and still is, the nurturing mother hen of all five kids. Jacob today is on a full ride at Columbia Law School. I'm actually going to see him this weekend and we hope to do a Periscope from New York City. He's interested in working in human rights. Johanna teaches for Brave Writer and will be going into her master's for social work. Noah is working on a computer programming degree. Liam and Katrin are both sophomores in college. Liam took time off after high school to travel and started college the same year she did. Now, right now, if all five kids continue with the educational paths they're on, I will have five graduations <laughs> in May of 2018. So I'm hoping one of them either speeds up or slows down because there's no way that I, you just know some of them are going to overlap. But that's, that is the outcome of my years of working as a home educator. And each one has forged a path that is unique for that person. They have some things in common. They have some things that are different. And I want to start with that idea. A big family is a collection of individuals. A big family is a collection of individuals. There's a temptation to just think about the family identity. Oh, we're the Bogarts. Oh, we're the Smiths. Oh, we're the Hills. And that's a wonderful thing. My kids love that identity. But then within that group, our personalities, our ambitions and desires that don't line up. And sometimes those are even in conflict with each other. For example, Johanna was always planning to go to college. Noah wasn't quite so sure. And yet he was the oldest. And so sometimes it felt like he wasn't the role model she was expecting to have. Correct? It's not like there was ill will exactly. It was more like, well, if he doesn't go off to college, will I? I was homeschooled like he was. These are the thoughts that go through their minds. And our task as parents is to be able to support their individuality while also affirming the collective identity of the group. It's both, it's both and. Um, one of the things I loved about having five kids as opposed to a smaller family is that I felt like at the dinner table, there were people to really talk to, look across the table at. There was always someone to play a game with. So if you have a big family, those are your benefits. You have lots of partners and a lot of people who are willing to sort of participate with each other. And then the challenge is finding ways for them to each have some alone time, some downtime. And because a big family has a lot of personality, you're going to have conflicts over who gets to be on the computer, who gets the corner seat of the couch, who has the best chair at the table, who's using the best number two pencil. All of this is part of big family life. And it's unavoidable. Unavoidable. 
You will solve some of these problems on a day-to-day -day basis, but the friction of human beings living in a family space together is always going to feel a little bit like controlled chaos, right? And it's totally okay if that's the way that it is. You are doing it right if that's how it goes. <laughs> Corner seat, are you spying on my kids? Of course, see, I had kids. I know what they argue about, right? They argue about the cutest things and the most annoying things. And hey, move your elbow. I can't brush my teeth while I'm standing next to you at our tiny sink in our tiny bathroom. These are the things you deal with as a parent all the time. Now, I remember talking one time with a therapist about big families. And I had this big agenda that kids get along all the time. And so if my kids got in conflict, we would try and sit them down, do sort of the therapist couch thing where he says what he's feeling, she feeds it back, then she says what she's feeling, he feeds it back, and then they try to come up with some kind of solution. So my kids hated that. <laughs> um, we did it, though, uh, many times. Anyway, I don't know if it was a good idea. Um, as adults, they look back sometimes with fondness on it. But at the time, they didn't love it. I talked with a therapist about it once, and she said, siblings are not like a married couple. They know in a way that married couples never know it, that they will always be related. And they have this ability to sort of clock up against each other and then separate and then come back together as if nothing happened. And in our fretting and anxiety about making sure everyone gets together, sometimes we overdo it with the apologies, with the making nice. It's not to say that we shouldn't teach them how to repair. And I think that's an important part of the family dynamic and an important thing to do. But sometimes you can overdo it as well and it starts to feel false. So I just leave that with you. That wasn't even on my talk today, but it just came to me as I was talking. So let's talk about homeschool. Okay, ready? One big happy family. Let's start out with what doesn't work when you're home educating your kids. Okay. Oh my goodness, come on. I actually need like a Vanna White. <laughs> I don't think I can do this by myself very well. Oh, it's just gonna come off. Well, how about that? All right. What doesn't work? Well, I'll tell you the one thing that doesn't work is this sheet of paper. All right, hold on. You're all being very, very sweet to me right now. Let's go this way. All right, what doesn't work? Number one, scope and sequence. The first thing that doesn't work in homeschooling is scope and sequence, no matter how many kids you have. And the temptation when you have more kids is to think it's more important than it is. Let me explain what I mean. I'm gonna block this now. Scope and sequence is number one. Here's the problem with it. You aren't teaching 30 kids in one classroom who are all the same age, where you're making sure that they're all sort of moving forward at the same rate. That's what scope and sequence is designed for. It's designed for 25 to 30 kids in one room or for whole school districts where they've got thousands of kids to supervise. You don't, you have a big group, but none of them are at the same age level. And some of them are going to spurt ahead in a subject and lag behind in another one. And half the time, they don't even know what grade they're in. Have you experienced that? You know, you're at the potluck at church or you go to Thanksgiving dinner at your in-laws house and somebody says, so Sally, what grade are you in? And she's like, uh, mom, mom, what grade am I in? Like they don't track it the way that you do. So the problem with, yes, asynchronous learning, beautiful language. The problem with scope and sequence is that it can lock you in to thinking that all the subjects have to keep pace with what's happening at school. The beauty of homeschooling is that you can tailor make the education so that a child who struggles with writing but is advanced in reading can have both of those needs addressed. The reason this is especially critical to mention in a big family is that one of the tendencies in a big family is to want to institutionalize to get some order, to get some structure. It's harder to know each child as intimately when you have six kids than it is if you only have one. And so one of the ways that you are tempted to evaluate them is to match them up against a rubric because it's exhausting to focus on one child and really know them well when you've got five others in the wings. Does that make sense? So you want to focus 
on the individual child on their skill sets and i'm going to show you how to do that in a way that won't drive you utterly bonkers okay and then if you need more help than that you can certainly join us in the homeschool alliance in my coaching community where we work on this kind of stuff all the time coach juliebogart.com i don't mean to give an ad but i just know i won't address everything that you're going to wonder at the end of this scope so if this is something that interests you Come there. We focus on cognitive development, how to keep track of what's going on with each child, and ways to feel progress happening in the homeschool. So the first thing that doesn't work is scope and sequence. Okay? Number two, timed lessons. And when I say timed, I mean like a school bell schedule, where you say, okay, everybody's going to do spelling for an hour. That doesn't work. We're going to talk about how to organize spelling for everybody or reading for everybody or writing for everybody, but you can't do it by one of those planners, you know? I'm not saying you can't use a planner. A lot of homeschool parents use bullet journals and they use planners to sort of get the information that's trapped in their heads out physically in front of their eyes where they can make plans. But what I'm talking about is following a bell schedule. You know, we're going to start, a, we're going to start our day with chores at 8. At 9, we're going to start reading. At 10, we're going to do math. The problem with that is, if you have a range of ages, particularly if some of those kids are not yet school-aged, they're going to throw a bomb into the living room. I call it the homemade hand grenade. They're just going to, you know, blow out the diaper, or you're going to have a colicky baby, or one of your kids is going to complete their work really quickly while the other one is really struggling. And so you wind up feeling out of sync with your plan all day, every day, and you think you're not making progress. And you might make some progress, and that might reinforce this temptation to keep that going. But what I want to share with you is that from my like vast experience of hanging out with so many of my friends, running Brave Rider, having my own family of five, none of those sort of bell schedule formats last long enough to feel like now I'm in my groove. You can sort of get it going for a month or a few weeks or, you know, our big joke in Brave Rider, in the fall, classical education, in the winter, Charlotte Mason, in the spring, unschooling. When you have all that new fall energy, you can sort of marshal it a little bit more than you might in the spring, for instance. But just know that even if you set up a schedule like that, it's likely to get shipwrecked or to fall apart or to not sustain itself forever. I'm not saying you shouldn't ever try it. All I'm saying is, is that it really doesn't work as well with a big group as you wish it would. Somebody says she likes my emphasis on routine, and we're getting there. But that's exactly right. There's a difference between schedule and routine. And routine, just as a quick, temp, you know, we'll get there when we get to what works. But routine is different in that it is sort of a predictable cycle as opposed to a bell schedule. Okay? So we're getting there. All right, so we found out scope and sequence doesn't work. Timed lessons don't work. Okay, number three, focusing on the oldest, focusing on the youngest. How many of you know, focusing on the oldest, focusing on the youngest, how many of you know that your oldest child gets the lion's share of your attention for their whole lives? Now, you may dispute that with me. Maybe you have one of those oldest child children who are really doing a great job. You know, they're helping you out, they're on track, they seem really responsible. But what happens is, no matter what your oldest child is doing, it's the most interesting thing in parenting because you've never done it before. So no matter what age they are, whether they're 2, 4, 10, 16, or 25, you're going to notice that your oldest child draws your attention and you do tend to worry about the oldest more because you just don't know how it's all going to work out but the flip side of that is the youngest because the youngest is adorable and all the pressure you put on the oldest you take off of the youngest so the oldest at age four you expected to cooperate with you in target but the four-year-old that's your youngest and you've got three four five kids older than them you're like, oh, she's so cute. She just wants a sucker. You become like a grandma to your youngest, and your oldest continues to be the one you expect to act responsibly. So what doesn't work in a big family is excessive attention on the oldest child or the youngest child, but it's inevitable. It's really hard to let that go. 
So one of the things that I explain, oh, my youngest gets what we call benign neglect. Yes, Rebecca, right. Or they also get cooed over. You carry them around more. Um, I know for me, once I knew I was at the end of all five kids, like I knew we weren't having more kids, well, now she's the last one to fill in the blank, stop breastfeeding. The last one to want to sit in my lap while I read picture books. The last one to learn how to tie her shoes, right? So instead of it being the first, now it's all this grieving and sadness and nostalgia and romance. Oh, she's the last one to, right? So I just want to make you aware that that's what happens to parents. It's not bad. It's not wrong. And you can't do anything about it, really. It's going to happen. But what you can do is not let it dictate your homeschool strategy. Your middle kids deserve some really concentrated, focused attention on their needs. And it's okay to dial back the panic about the oldest child because you're gonna find out once you've been through it and you go to the next kid, you weren't that upset. You weren't that worried because you've seen it work. So I'm here to be like the grandma who's like, see, five kids turned out. My friends, all their kids, they're doing okay. And you can give some of that expenditure of energy in a more deliberate way to the middle kids. Um, okay, I tend to focus on second because of dyslexia. So this is another good point. It's easy to focus on a child who is struggling with a learning challenge because you really want to get them up to speed. So Liam was dysgraphic. He was my fourth child. Very tempting to spend a lot of energy thinking about how to solve that problem and then miss out on the joy of watching Jacob, who is a self-starting, self-taught kid. I don't get to enjoy that because I'm so worried about dysgraphia. Is that a good thing? No. One of the things that I always recommend is keeping track. I used to have one of those wall calendars before iPhones existed, and I would actually write on the calendar pages when I had focused attention on one of my kids. Like, wow, we had a really good day today. And if several weeks went by and I started noticing that the middle child didn't get a good dose of me, eye contact, cuddling, conversation, I could actually see the record and I could make it happen. Oh, wow, if you can hold mental lists, you're far superior human being to me. Everything I do has to be written down or it's etch-a-sketch brain, it just goes away. But yeah, you can actually be deliberate about how you create connection with your children and just be alert that your tendency is going to be the special needs kid, the oldest child, or the youngest. Those tend to be the places where we energize around our families the most. And we overlook the cooperative, quiet, you know, parent-pleasing child who deserves to be noticed for being such a pleasure and joy. I always call those kids add water and stir, right? Like they came ready-made. You just pour in a little water, stir, and there they are, right? Okay, so what's the next one? So we've done scope and sequence. Ignore. Time lessons. Don't work. Pay attention to the fact that you might be focusing on the oldest and youngest more than the middle kids. And lastly, here we are. This is what somebody already brought up. Too much routine, too much inspiration. Let's talk about that for a minute. So my system, if you want to call it one, for home education that worked with my family was this. We set up a routine that we could always rely on. And then if inspiration caught us, we suddenly had a great idea or an invitation to the art museum or a picnic, or it was ski season and we wanted to ski every week, we would just ditch the routine. And I would not think to myself, uh oh, now we're getting behind on math. I would simply resume math the day after the inspiration had left. But it is possible to get too much routine where the days get long and tedious and boring and you're doing the same thing day in and day out and you're home all the time and you never see, you know, the three-dimensional people. <laughs> you're only watching TV. You're only on the computer. You're only doing workbooks. You're only having even poetry tea times. You've just got this like method in place and it's working, but it becomes so familiar. It becomes wallpaper in your life. It's no longer pleasurable. That's too much routine, but it is possible 
for you to feel too much inspiration, where you're chasing every rabbit trail of an idea. You think every subject has to be arts and crafts. You believe that there is no subject that you can just treat like lunch. I always call it lunch. You know, you don't make the same meal at lunch that you make at dinner. So you want to have some kind of a balance. And it's okay if you do it in spurts. For example, our routine was strongest in the winter months because there's nothing to do in Ohio in the winter outdoors. But in the fall and in the spring, well then that's when I wanted to take advantage of picnics in the backyard or going to the park or visiting the zoo every week. And so I necessarily let go of some of the routine. So you wanna think seasonally, like what are we like in the fall? What are we like in the winter? And what are we like in the spring? Which time of year is the time when sports are the most important to you? You know, we don't play a lot of sports in the winter here. So when we're in the big sports season of fall and spring, that's going to be a very different dynamic for our whole family than in the winter. So you can sort of plan activities, outings, the seasonal work. And you know what? If you had a really good winter of read alouds, copy work, dictation, maybe you did your grammar program, you took an online class with Brave Writer, you uh, went to the art museum. If that was your winter, and then in the spring you kind of dumped copy work and dictation and kids read to themselves and you were outside doing nature journaling and hiking and you decided to grow vegetables in your backyard and learn how to sew, that's awesome. And your family, your big family benefits from that kind of flexibility. So how do you make these things happen though with a big family, right? Like what does the routine look like when you've got toddlers climbing on the table and you've got big kids who are irritated with younger kids thwarting them, right? So let's say you've set up this nice little routine. You're gonna wake up, you know, I have a whole scope called morning, uh, morning time or morning routine. Look that one up because I go into detail and I don't wanna repeat myself. But basically the idea is this. Kids wake up when they wake up, they spend a little time waking up, then they eat some breakfast and then they get dressed, and then morning time starts. And everybody is involved. You can read to all levels of kids, unless of course they're teenagers and don't want to be read to, in which case they're free to go. They don't have to do what little kids are doing. They can take care of themselves. But the idea is for everyone to sort of start together to have a feeling of family before they break apart into their individual pursuits. And if that only comes at breakfast and then everyone splits up, the older ones and the younger ones, sometimes it's like you have two families, you know, the older kids need one kind of parenting and homeschooling and the younger ones have a different kind, that's okay. Togetherness is enforced by the walls of the house. It doesn't have to be enforced by the activity, okay? All right, so, We've looked at what doesn't work. Time for what works. Ready? Let me look at my clock. Perfect. Oh my gosh, we're halfway through. Hang in there. We're doing great. And we'll take questions at the end. What doesn't work? Oh, you're seeing it before I want you to. <laughs> All right, here we go. What does work? Number one, group projects. This is my probably best tip. And group projects work best for these four subject areas. Can you even see that? It's pretty small. Science, history, writing, arts and crafts. There are other ones I'm sure that would work, but these are the main ones. You can work as a group at all different levels on these four items. Not so much with math, not so much with learning to read or spell, but you can certainly, science, history, writing and crafts, you can do these as a group, and I'm gonna tell you how now. A group project is this. It is selecting a topic that everybody engages in at their level. So let's say you're using the classical history cycle. You don't have one child in ancient history and one child in modern history. How can you be an effective family coach when you have to master and know two kinds of subjects, I mean two um, aspects of the same subject simultaneously? Very difficult. In fact, years ago, I was actually on a radio show in Los Angeles. Someone was bashing homeschooling. So I called in because, you know, gotta defend the, the faithful. <laughs> and I said, 
What you're not understanding about homeschooling is that it is family learning. And so when my kids are learning about colonial American history, they all are. And I know what we're talking about and reading and exploring together during the day. So at dinner, when their dad comes home, we're all caught up in colonial American history and we might watch a video as a family that night or we might act out a scene or we might read poems written during that era. But the whole family is sort of like colonial history for a period of time. So then this radio announcer came back and he said, yeah, but we do that at the dinner table. I asked my daughter about her school day. I said, yes, but if your son is studying something else, he isn't participating. And that clicked for him. He said, that's an aspect of homeschool I didn't understand because that's an aspect of our lives. Now, we seem to know this for history, but we don't seem to know it sometimes for science or for writing. Writing, I see this all the time. Writing can be done as a group. Here are a few ways to make writing more conducive to a large family. Now, when I say large, let's just define terms for a minute. I'm not necessarily meaning that the 18-year-old and the 5-year-old are working on the same project. If you've got 10 kids, you've really got two groups of five. And you might need to moderate between those two groups, maybe even every other day. That might be the way you manage. But what you want to make sure is that you've got sort of a collection. We're going to talk about math in a minute. Um, you've got sort of a collection of kids that are able to handle the same project idea, but execute at their skill level. So for instance, let's say you've decided that they're gonna study art a la Charlotte Mason, and everybody is going to produce some kind of a narration about a painting. Well, for the small kids, maybe they just have paint brushes and paint, and they're gonna try and make paint marks on a page that remind them of that painting, or they'll use oil pastels or crayons. But if you've got somebody who's in eighth grade, and I did, he was able to draw it with colored pencil and handwrite his own written narration in cursive. But we're all looking at the same painting. Someone said, what about a big age difference? Well, literally I had toddlers and someone in junior high. So that is a big age difference. And yet the toddler could play with clay or color just the same way that the oldest could express a narration in writing and detailed drawing. And then we had everything in between. Liam could tell me what he loved about the painting and I could jot it down for him. We could Xerox the painting for him and he could glue it onto the same page as his narration. Whereas the older three, they could actually draw it and then they might need me, Jacob might have needed me to handwrite his narration and let him trace over it. Or perhaps he could only do a sentence and my oldest one could do a paragraph. But we're all looking at the same painting. I'm not saying, well, right now I'm going to do Monet with the younger kids and Picasso with the older kids. Does that make sense? We had sort of a corporate experience of art. This happens with all kinds of writing projects, but even more. You can actually have everyone working on the same writing project. What if you do the end of the year family newsletter and every single child contributes something? One kid co contributes headlines, another kid contributes interviews, another kid writes what everyone does in sports for the whole year. And you put this all together and it's one synthesized family project and it reflects everybody's stages of development as opposed to, well, you know, the second grader can write a letter, but the eighth grader should be writing an essay. If you start thinking collaboratively, almost like you're producing a published work with a variety of roles, you're gonna see a whole different attitude around writing in your family because there's this collected energy. You're not so spread out. Now, do you do this for every writing project? Probably not, I didn't. But I remember, for example, after we had been studying ancient Egypt, my kids got really interested in embalming fluid. And so all of a sudden in the mail, we got this big, um, what do you call them? Mail order catalog for Apple Mall. You know, they called it the Mac Mall, I think. And I saw that and I turned to my kids and I said, we should make our own mail order catalog for embalming fluids and ancient Egypt's 
you know, um, processes that they use to mummify. Well, my kids thought that was a great idea. So Noah and Johanna produced it together. They decided, each one divided up which kind of, you know, item they were going to represent. They started reading through the mail order catalogs that we got to get a feel for the language. And then they just spoofed the whole thing. They called it the Mesopotamia Mall. And they did artwork and they wrote captions and they even came up with pricing based on the kind of money that was used back then. I think it was called Deben, if any of you are studying ancient Egypt. It was a collaborative project. And at the end, we color Xeroxed it and bound it at Kinko's and gave one to each of them. But it was hard to know where it started and where it ended. It was two kids working on one project. And you know, there is energy released when there is more than one person. Now, I know some kids will be protective and they want their own thing and it's fine with me if that's true. But you might try this. Just see what happens if there's a collaborative effort. You can even throw out an idea like, we're all going to write about fairy tales. And one of the things you'll notice is the way a five-year-old writes about fairy tales and the way an adult or a teenager writes, totally different, still an amazing subject. I mean, a 16-year-old could do a spoof. They could do a feminist fairy tale. Five-year-old's just going to retell the fairy tale. Or maybe your 15-year-old's going to do an original fairy tale. She's already taken in all the properties of a fairy tale and now she's going to do a modern one set in you know the ymca see what i mean what we want to do is recognize that people just naturally bring their skill set to the table and their maturity scope and sequence makes us think that somehow a fairy tale is for a child and not for an adult and yet you know phd students have written dissertations about fairy tales it's not about the subject matter. It's bringing your personal skill set to that subject matter. And sometimes it's just easier if everybody's on the same subject and we allow them to express their skills through that subject together. It just creates this cohesion in the family that stops the craziness for you, poor exhausted parent who can't keep up with each person's individual subject and give the same level of brainstorming together. Rebecca said she's finding that the 13 year old likes the jot it down projects, of course. And honestly, something for you to know. Oh, a book catalog. Oh my God, what a great idea of all the books you've read with little reviews. What a great idea. We had one mom actually create um, like almost like a library table in her house and each child stood up a book and wrote a review and then they invited their friends from homeschool over to read the reviews and they could just take home whichever book they wanted based on the reviews the kids gave, you know, five stars, and, and then they had like tea afterwards. Um, I know another mom who, and we did this a little bit, I wasn't as good at it as some parents, um, but I learned this from a Charlotte Mason list. You make a natural history museum in your living room, you empty out a bookcase, and you start collecting all of the things that you want from, from nature, and you identify them and make the little tags, and you leave, you know, you give each kid a shelf and they can collect and be as detailed or not as they want to. But that's everyone collaborating. Um, so I started to say something else and now I lost it. Does someone remember where I was? Um, so the idea then is collaboration around a similar idea. It's not necessary or same subject area, but you don't necessarily have to pander. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. The Jot It Down product that we made in Brave Writer that has 10 month-long writing projects. Almost everything in it was done by all five of my kids. True for partnership writing as well. So you can sort of scale up or scale down for children based on how much support they need from you. But the subject matter is gonna be interesting. I mean, secret codes are interesting whether you're 16 or you're five. But a 16 year old might actually dig into the enigma phenomenon from World War II and take it to a place that the five year old can't. But the whole family can be immersed in secret codes, you know, for a month. Why not? Much more interesting. Plus, when you have a big family, anytime you do secret codes, letter writing, passing notes, story building, it feels wonderful to have partners. And there are so many partners to choose from in a big family. So take advantage of that. Let them talk to each other. Let them write notes to each other. You know, what if your big 
older kids wrote notes to your younger kids. One of the things Johanna used to do is jot down Katrin's stories on her behalf because she had seen me doing it. This is a way for Johanna to practice her own skills in transcription and a way for Katrin to feel validated and for them to build a relationship. It's not all on me. Now, I didn't script that. That happens spontaneously. But my point is that that can happen spontaneously. And it can be suggested because some kids would love doing that. One tool that has changed homeschool forever that we only caught the tail end of, digital recording. Now, I literally had a digital recorder. I didn't have an iPhone. They didn't exist. But you have iPhones. You have Samsung Galaxy 5s. Put it in the hand of an older child and ask that kid to interview a younger child. And that older child can transcribe the whole thing. They can learn how to edit it. And they can give it back as a gift to the younger child. It allows the younger child to narrate in a way that they won't when you're just asking them a question. And it allows the older child the practice of good interviewing skills and creating this work that is a gift back to the younger child. And the bonding, oh my goodness, will be so strong. My kids created their own um, podcast together. In fact, I think one of them, would you have them write a transcript? Sure, sure. That's exactly what I'm saying. They're going to interview them and then they're going to transcribe it, type it up print it out and give it away. Now, um, I had kids who did podcasts. They, we didn't have the capacity to do them back then. But what we did is we just used GarageBand and my kids interviewed each other. They were called um, something like Fascinating, Con oh no, Interesting Conversations with Katrin and Jacob. I still have them. They're absolutely hilarious. You want to make use of technology and the natural bond of friendship that your children share. My kids did all kinds of book club style parties. They had Harry Potter parties where they made all the cookies together, invited all their friends over, played all kinds of, you know, Q and A's together. They shared books. When we were on the whole Harry Potter craze, they would take turns and time each other. Okay, you get to have it for 30 minutes, then it's my turn. These are all family dynamic issues that actually create an incredible amount of love and bonding. Your older kids who want to play on the computer all the time, Perhaps one of the ways they get the chance to do that is if they're willing to play Mario Kart with the younger kids for a little while to give you time with another child in the family. So also pairing play and giving the older kids a chance to be the skillful one and the younger kid a chance to get some relational nurturing from an older sibling. Those are all ways, okay? So group projects for science, history, writing, and of course, crafts. Everybody can do drawing. When we learned how to draw, we all did it together. When we ever did crafts, I had multiple glue guns, multiple stations, and everybody performed at their own level. And it's just wonderful to be together. Now, why doesn't this work with math? Let's talk about that for a minute. There is so much math you can do as a family. I shared last week about the book Family Math, which I just found. Oh, I have it. Let me show it to you. Hold on. I was hoping I had it handy. Hold on. Uh-oh. Oh! There goes the Tower of Books. This is the book called Family Math. You can do this as a family. Now, they'll need to move forward in their own math skills, and I have no problem with that. So maybe they can all do math at the same time, but in their own books, right? <laughs> Mommy Julie knows about Mario Kart, of course. <laughs> I have five kids. This book is fabulous. It's filled with activities. Um, let me find one just to show you. This is what they look like. And you can do this with your kids. And one of the things that I would do possibly is just do an activity for math, family math once a week or once a month. Just bring everyone together. Or maybe have everyone do puzzles. Or everyone does tangrams. Or everybody builds with blocks. Or everybody plays with Legos. And you count that. That is a mathematical system. You do it together. Find opportunities to get rid of this one by one, one at a time, everybody needing a piece of mom. Think about ways that you can pull yourselves together on a regular basis because that's going to buy you time for the one-on-one. -on -one. And we're getting there. So don't, don't get ahead of me and say, but I have to teach math. Okay. Oh, look, 
We're there. Number two, rotating one-on-one -on -one time. Now I already told you, and, and can you see that? These are really looking small. Rotating one-on-one -on -one time. So interestingly, I've heard people talk about bullet journals, about ways to facilitate these one-on-ones in big families. I think Sarah McKenzie of Read Aloud Revival did a fantastic scope on this subject, and she is current. You know, I'm aging. <laughs> My kids are grown. So I'm talking about it from memory, not from the current chaos that many of you are in. So I don't want you to fantasize that I have forgotten. I haven't forgotten, but I will tell you that there are young moms right now dealing with these issues and you guys want to stick together and help each other. Someone asked if I did phone counseling. Um, we don't do phone. We do it on this website and it costs money, but it's, you know, like 20 bucks a month, 24 bucks a month or 1495 if you pay for the year at once. And, um, we do all kinds of stuff to help you figure this stuff out for your particular family. Yes, yeah, Sarah's great. Sarah's great. In fact, I'll just tell you, she and I are doing a scope together next week when she's in town. So that's going to be really fun. And we'll do it on my account. So you will see us then. But anyway, the point is this. I remember her saying something about how, you know, she would assign a toddler to an older child while she worked with a middle child. And she'd just rotate that around. Very smart. Great solution as long as it doesn't feel like child labor, okay? I am not a big fan of mother's little helpers. Now, I know if you have 10 kids, maybe you just have to do it that way. But with five, I didn't want my kids... Yeah, I, we'll get to math. I, I did say that, and it's coming. I didn't like the idea that my kids were mini mothers. I love having my kids involved with each other. But I didn't want them to feel like their job was to be a mother in my absence. That said, strategically pairing an older child with a younger child so you can get some one-on-one -on -one time and rotate through your kids, that just might be the practical, functional solution to getting things done. I know that I used video more with Katrin than I did with Noah because I needed her occupied sometimes and I wanted to be able to focus on the older kids. So these are the deals with the devil you make, and it's okay. They're going to survive it. Just pay attention to the emotional welfare of all your kids. If you have not been taking notes on who's getting your lion's share of attention, start doing that so you can give it to them. So what about math? So you can certainly do, like I said, family math time. But what I found with my kids is they could all sit at the table and work through their independent math books but sometimes a process required my focused attention. And if my oldest was working on Algebra 1 and my youngest was just starting fractions, I am not good enough at math to manage both of those simultaneously. They would take all my energy to do. For some of you, that's true with writing. Like it takes a huge amount of energy for you to get your brain wrapped around this one piece. And it's going to take you having that undistracted time with the child. So you want to be strategic about that. You want to offer your kids opportunities to have just your focused attention so that they learn whatever that skill is and then they can go back to working on it at the table with everybody who's doing math and move forward. We typically tried to keep um, our kids doing the same subject matter but maybe not doing the same content when it was a skill-based issue like learning to read, like working through a grammar book, uh, even something like copy work and dictation depended. We could all do copy work at the same time, but sometimes dictation, there are different levels and I can't be reading one passage and expecting all five kids to be able to copy that down. So dictation had to often happen while other kids were preoccupied doing something else you know, playing Legos while I work with the two that are at the right level for this one passage. Are you following me? Does this make sense? Did that answer the question? I hope so. Okay. So you want to rotate the one-on-one -on -one time. You want to look ahead. There's nothing wrong with Sunday night, just kind of looking ahead. Like what's coming? So much angst could be prevented if we just looked ahead. But I'm terrible at looking ahead, so I'll just admit that right now because I hate calendars. I have this thing, I, I won't look at a calendar. 
So one of the things that I had to make myself learn how to do was actually open the math book and flip ahead a few pages and see what's coming. And if I knew it was a big concept that I didn't know how to do, I needed to do it with them on whatever day that was. Um, yeah, I am losing my voice. I'm sorry about that. It's been very dry here, and when it's dry, I lose my voice. Um, yeah, so rotating one-on-one -on -one time, looking ahead a little bit, being ready so you don't get blindsided, but you're still going to get blindsided. And there are going to be days that you aren't intentional, and that's okay. But I'm just giving you tips, right? So tips work when they work, and then there are days they just don't work because you're just not with it, and that's okay too. That's all part of parenting five eight kids. All right, next one. Co-ops. How many of you are in co-ops with your big group of kids? I'd like to see yes and no in the comments so I can get a feel for if you are doing co-ops. No, yes. Yes, yes, no, yes, yes, no. So it looks like maybe a little bit more yeses than noes. Maybe not. Maybe it's about half and half. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about co-ops for a minute because there are the co-ops that help, and there are the co-ops that hurt, okay? So here's what I've discovered. For me, for my kids, it felt nice for them to have a weekly place to see friends that I didn't have to organize, and to know that there were friends for them at every single age. So it wasn't like we were playing with a family that had two of my kids' ages, but then the other three had no one to play with. This was like, oh, we show up on a Monday at this building, and everybody has someone their age, and I didn't have to plan it. I didn't have to drive to five houses. I'm just here, and I'm socializing with women my age, and the kids are all socializing with kids their ages. I happen to be a part of a fabulous co-op. We used it mostly for extracurricular. I think a couple of them took some core subjects. We did have someone taking math, logic, ASL, and I'm trying to think if there was any other core subject. Oh, and biology. We did do those subjects there, but mostly they took Taekwondo, acting, arts and crafts, nature journaling, photography, um, things that I wanted them to experience, but that were harder for me to do when I had five kids. Hard to teach photography to the oldest kid who can handle the camera when you're nursing a baby. So I saw co-op as an enrichment program a place where my kids could make friends and do things they don't get to do with me at home. I loved our co-op. We had about 100 families, about 300 kids. Now that's not available to everyone, I realize. Here's the, co oh, recess club, that's adorable, perfect. Um, I also had, when I lived in California, we had no co-op like that, but we were in community with five families. And each family took responsibility to plan a big party-style field trip during the year. So one family did a medieval feast. I did a party all about birding. Another family did one with electricity. Another family did one with baking. And we just rotated who was in charge so that it never all fell on me. And we got together every other month of the school year and it would be five families and all of our very small children. And we would do these big parties. So you don't necessarily have to have a building and a hundred families in a co-op like that. You could do a cooperative with a small group, but here's the benefit of that with a big family. You give your kids the opportunity to interface with other children their ages, and you take some of the pressure off of you to provide all the magic and all of the teaching, and all of the fun, because kids need a lot of doses, and the more kids you have, the harder it is to satisfy everybody's need for fun. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's my thing about co-ops. Now, here's the problem with some co-ops. Some co-ops feel like ball and chain. They're so academically oriented that you end up feeling more pressure between the two weeks because you suddenly have to live up to a school schedule, all of these pages to fill out, all of this stuff to get done, and now the little kids are in the way of you helping the older one write an essay a week for these classical works that he isn't really getting. Those are not helpful co-ops, and they're not helpful for big families. So if you are in something like that, and it is shipwrecking your peace, it's not worth it. 
start something else. Get out, find your friends, and start something that is nourishing and enrichment oriented as opposed to high standard academics because for big families that can feel like a lot of pressure you know if you have an only child or two kids maybe it's great but I know for me with five there was no way in heck I was going to submit to that kind of structure and feel that level of pressure okay here's the last thing that works ready I'm going to hold it up here here if you want to screenshot all of these, these are what work. Time off for errands, for play, and for cleanup. Time off. What do I mean by that? It means no homeschool that day. I found that I was a happier person if I didn't try to squeeze grocery shopping in around the edges. In fact, we treated grocery shopping like a field trip. I threw all the kids in the car. We would anticipate what we were going to shop for. When we went to this one really amazing store in our neighborhood, I used to always tell them, let's pick one exotic piece of fruit or a vegetable we've never had. And then that's what we'll do when we get home. And we'll figure out which of those, you know, um, foods is something we want to incorporate into our lives. And, you know, on my better days, which happened, what, five times, we actually looked up where that food was from and how it was used in their culture and whatever. But mostly it was just to keep people focused on a mission while we were on this trip, like something to look forward to, not just being dragged along in the shopping cart by mom. So I tried to just take a day off for errands. We'd go grocery shopping, we'd make shopping, we'd make our run to Target. We might stop at a playground or a park on the way home. I might throw sandwiches in a basket so we'd have something to eat. It's incredible. And you can also, oh, I love that. You take every Friday off. That's wonderful. Home Ec Monday for years. Oh, you guys, this is great. This is great. Library day. Yeah, we went to the library once a week religiously when my kids were young. It was our favorite day because they got to pick out things for free so they could bring home 20 books. Do you know how empowering that is to a kid? They love that. You never have to say no. It's incredible. Yeah, field trip Friday. When we got zoo passes one year, we went every single week. No matter if it was snowing or raining, we just got in the car and went because it felt like liberation. So feel free to take the day, time off to clean up or run errands. And it's okay to take a day to clean up. Like we've talked a lot about chores. I'm not a huge fan of doing them in the school day because it just sets you off on such a bad trajectory. Nobody's happy unless your family loves them or is on a farm and needs to do them and it's a part of your family culture. But for most of us suburbanites, chores means making your bed. Like, okay. So what I would rather do is just pick a morning. We typically did them on Saturday morning uh, and get the things done that keep the house in working order. Now, I just thought I was at the end and I forgot I had five more. <laughs> so here we go. Five more. I'm going to whip through them because we're at our time limit. Okay. So partnering with another homeschool family, I already said that one. That's what you can do instead of a co-op. Get somebody else to help you. And you can also swap teaching. I swapped with a friend. I taught writing. She taught my kids math. It was fabulous. If you can do that, do it. Number six, hire somebody, a mother's helper. There are so many people around who would love their daughters to make a little money or their sons to make a little money and play with your kids. So if you need one-on-one -on -one focused attention with somebody working on a really big project or a hard subject, just invite one of your friends with big families over and see if one of them wants to pick up, you know, 10 bucks and spend two hours playing with your toddlers. You know, let's say you want to teach your kids how to snow, sew, but the toddler is going to just climb on the sewing machine. Get someone to come over and look after her. All right, number seven, household tasks on the weekend. I just said that. Number eight, stay home. Don't go out too much. You do want to go out, but not too much. So I liked going out one day a week. That worked for us, but I couldn't have done two because those four days really needed me to be home with my kids. And we had a much better chance for inspiration to hit us if we were actually in a rhythm together and got along and knew what was coming. Okay, number nine. Take advantage of non-traditional hours. You are together 24 hours a day. If you have one of those magical children that goes to bed before eight, <laughs> I 
never had one. But if you do, you could stay up late with a teenager and do discussion about the book they're reading at bedtime. Um, you might find that some kids do better after dinner working with you on writing or math than they do during the day when everyone is running around the house playing and the toddler needs your attention and you're nursing the baby, right? Um, yes, I did take my kids to lessons. We used um, tutors for logic, I mean, uh, excuse me, for Latin, for math, for learning art, for music lessons, for ballet, like all that stuff. We did. But I had a rule that every kid only got to do one weekly practice thing per year, and it had to be just for a season. So like, if I and I could only have two doing something at the same time. Now I only had five kids. I don't know what you do with 10. But I found myself overwhelmed if we had three kids in sports. I couldn't do it. So we always had just two in something, ballet and soccer, or lacrosse and ballet, or theater and, you know, baseball. But I wasn't okay with everybody. It's really hard, especially because you sort of think they need it. But I'm here to tell you, it's wonderful. It's great activity. But most of them don't go on to do something more significant than that. Well, we picked who sat out based on opportunity. So, for example, lacrosse is always in the spring. So that meant if you're going to play soccer and your brother wants lacrosse, soccer had to be in the fall because I couldn't do soccer and lacrosse at the same time. And soccer is offered fall and spring, but lacrosse wasn't. When we did ballet, I made sure that the ballet um, schedule coordinated with whatever sport team was happening at the same time. It was challenging. And I should tell you, it was really hard for me because my husband at the time, he taught sun Saturday mornings and Wednesday nights. So I was like dragging kids places. When we did vintage dance, we all had to sit there, all the kids watching the two oldest ones do vintage dance lessons. So that fall, there were no sports because Saturday mornings I was having, I would have had to go to two different games and I couldn't do two different games. So it's very challenging. I'm not saying there's an easy solution. I'm just telling you what worked for us. We just made sure that we didn't have more than two kids in kinds of weekly practices at a time. And where you live and what you do will vary. Okay, last one though. This is sort of like the bomb.com. This is one that I really had to learn and teach myself. Predictable storage. And here are the four categories. For each kid, for library books, for writing supplies, and for all your media. Predictable storage. What does that mean? It means you don't want the math book to go missing. It means that everybody knows where the pencils are. It means that the library books have a space so that you don't have to pay overdue fees. It is so frustrating in the morning to be ready to start the routine and nobody knows where any of their books are. So they need a little cubby hole or they need a little, um, what do you call those, uh, contain milk crate, something that is theirs where their workbooks, their math book, whatever they're working on, it goes in there every day. And then you want to take charge of writing utensils. I used to have them turn them into me. We had stuff around all the time for art, but keeping number two pencils sharpened or with lead in them if they were mechanical was important to me. And I didn't like how they disappeared so easily under the couches, in the cushions, out the door. So you have to sort of stay on top of it. My thought is have way more than you need. My mom gave me a great sort of practice early in my career. She said, Julie, stock up during the back to school sales for the whole year. You know, when you're broke, you kind of think, oh, I don't want to do that, but it saves you money and racing to the store later in the year. So just like buy twice as much as you think you need, hide half of it in a box under your bed, and there will be attrition over the year, but how much nicer to shop from under your bed than to have to go back to Office Depot with five kids, and then it'll be more expensive. Yeah, glue sticks, same thing. Assigning a pencil person to gather and sharpen for the week. These are great ideas. Yeah, we too. You know, I, I tell the funny story. One of my best friends from college homeschooled her seven kids. They're all adults now. And they were sitting having Thanksgiving dinner one night. And all of a sudden, one of the middle kids said, yeah, that's the year that I lost my math book. And Liz was like, 
you, you what? He goes, yeah, I lost it. I never found it. And she said, did I not know? He goes, well, there were seven of us. You never noticed. <laughs> he missed math for a whole year because the math book wasn't there. And somehow she just missed it. This is what happens with big families. And of course, he's a fully successful adult who went to college and is now married and has a full on job. So I hope that reassures you on some level. I'm not advocating losing the math book and never noticing. But stuff happens. This is what it is to have a big family and to have to be in charge of a lot of people. So if you can put some practices in place like the math book always goes here or each kid has their own, you know, cubby to hang on to it. Oh, you skipped sixth grade math and your mom never knew. Okay, that's hysterical. See, Petals of Zuzu. She actually understands what we're talking about here. Hilarious. And th stuff like this will happen. Yeah, your dad always joked that there was never scissors or tape. Okay, we had more scissors than any family I've ever met. I went on a, a scissor buying binge one year because I was so fed up with only having one or two pair and they always went missing. So I think at one point we had 20 pairs of scissors and that was about the right number. <laughs> Do you understand? So be willing to invest in the tools you need for homeschool to feel successful. Remember when you had a baby, a toddler with a pacifier, and at first you thought one was plenty, and then one day you realized, oh no, actually we need 10 pacifiers, one in the car, one in my purse, one in the crib, right? That's how I got with reading glasses. I suddenly had to have five pair of reading glasses, so they were anywhere I reached. So supplies are really important, and knowing that you have them on reserve that you can go to. And when you feel the reserves going down, when you're at the supermarket, just throw in another package of pencils. Just top it off. Buy, you know, multiple things of tape. Get the big container of all of the glue sticks from Costco. And you will just feel this relief come over you. And you can do it with felt and pipe cleaners too. And glue sticks and glue guns and um, sequins and painting and all of that. Don't be stingy about school supplies, okay? Pretend that this is your tuition for private school. And you're just spending it on school supplies. And you'll feel much more justified, okay? So, do we want to review real quick? These are the ones. Um, oops, I dropped it. Okay, these are the ones that work. Group projects in each of the subjects. Rotating one-on-one -on -one time. Joining a co-op if it's not crazy and insane and guilt-producing. Time off, true time off for errands, play, and cleanup. Where you don't do school that day. That's just what you do for the day. Then... Partnering with another family if it works, either trading subjects or just hanging out together or doing a version of a co-op with just a few families. Getting a mother's helper if you need someone to come in and entertain a few kids while you give some one-on-one -on -one time. And it doesn't have to be your kids. It's always more fun to take care of somebody else's kids. It doesn't feel like a chore. You could swap. You could have your kid go to your friend's house and your friend's kid come to your house. Um, household tasks on the weekend. Try not to overload on school days so that your kids have some energy for the school task. Stay home four days a week, okay? Try and hang out at house. Uh, it's not to say you'll never leave. You know, schedule dental appointments for the afternoon like your kids are in school because they are. And I heard someone say she is February the whole month for all doctor and dental visits because February is an awful month. I thought, what a brilliant idea. I wish I had thought of that. Um, use the non-traditional hours, whether that means Sunday afternoon is the time you go and read and discuss a book with your teenager over coffee, or you stay up late and you do writing with the kid who needs it at night, or you get up early with the early riser and you do all your read aloud time with that one child. That's a great way to maximize the homeschool with a big family. And then lastly, predictable storage for each kid for library books, for writing supplies, and media. How about that? Did we do it? Can I talk more about combining science? So for really old kids, science is going to be maybe a more systematic project. You might have a textbook or a class they're working through. But when you've got kids maybe sixth grade down to kindergarten, we just explored the natural world and the properties of physics 
using books like Blood and Guts, nature books that helped us nature journal better. We did a whole birding thing for years that everybody was involved in. Um, we did experiments as a group, not individually tailored. I remember when we made like those, um, those helicopter things that go off the balcony of your uh, condo in California to see the properties of flight, and we did it all together. So that's what I'm talking about. You can all participate in the experience of scientific experiments, um, and they get to participate at whatever level they can. Older kids can write it up using the scientific method, and younger kids just get to you know break eggs and, and ruin things. <laughs> Ninth through toddler, I have an idea of using the high school science to springboard a younger group. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. And you know, your kids who are learning about biology, that has spillover so well into blood and guts and the human body. I remember we did a whole thing on fingerprinting and then it, you know, spun off into um, police records and what it means to be identified by your fingerprints. and. You know, everybody participated, and the older kids got a whole different understanding of it than the younger ones, but we were all focused on the same thing. That, to me, is the biggest trick with a big family. Keep the topics united, even if the skill levels are different. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Julie Bogart. You can get coaching with me at this website. It is a community we call the Homeschool Alliance, and our community is growing and thriving. It's a fabulous group. If you want help with writing, we can help you with online classes that give you gentle accountability and a ton of support for the writing experience. And we have family classes where you're all doing poetry together. Just the very principles I just espoused. One price, everybody enrolled. Nature journaling is available right now if you want some support and that help of staying on track. Um, so spring registration is open. And I'm sure I'll be doing a scope this weekend with my son Jacob in New York. We're going to go see Fun Home, the musical, on Saturday night. He's going to give me a tour of Columbia University where he's a law student. We might visit the UN where he eventually wants to work. So I'm very excited about that. And maybe I can wrangle him into an interview. It would be very fun. Awesome. Thank you for coming. I love speaking with all of you. Have a wonderful few days and weekend, and hopefully I'll be on a spontaneous scope then. Until then, live honestly, write bravely. I'm Julie Bogart. Thanks so much for joining me today, everyone. Mwah. See you soon.